first of all, I do want to thank the NSERC Creates program and Clue. I spoke to the Clue community last year, and it would be really interesting if any of you were here, were here for that um, session last year, if you could tell me. That was very much focused on head style storytelling techniques. Today, the focus is a little bit more specific on how you can be the best presenter possible in this world, the world of the little green camera. But I do especially want to thank your program director, Dr. Audrey Girard, for accepting my proposal to speak here again with you this year and for Tamara for all her help and for everything that she does behind the scenes to make sure that by the time it's showtime, I'm ready, she's ready, you're ready, and we all have what we need. So here's what today is about. How can you present with real impact in this virtual world that we're all in now? It has a lot of advantages. I do a lot of my coaching, my one-on-one -on -one coaching with speakers over Zoom because I love the fact we can record our sessions. They can go back and listen at any time. And sometimes when you're working with a speaker, they'll have a moment of brilliance around a phrase that they, they just all of a sudden find that magic wording, or I will find them some wording for them. And sometimes people say, what did you just say? And I'll say, I don't know, I said it. You know, so it was in the moment, it's that. What we tap into creatively sometimes. So having the ability to go back in the Zoom, the Zoom view and, and uh, listen to those recordings is, is such a fantastic advantage when you're speaking in a virtual world. So that's, that's one thing to help you just, just know that I think most of you now are getting familiar with that little green camera. I'm going to throw a little poll up, or actually Tamara is going to put a little poll up for you um, so that we I can get a sense of just how comfortable you all are. I don't want to make any assumptions. So Tamara, if you could share that first poll, that would be great. I'm going to go back a slide. Just There we go. So choose the statement that best fits you right now in this moment. Be honest. Um, it's, it's anonymous. I'm not going to tell anybody in your circle or in your peer group um, who says what, but I do really want to see, take the temperature, the pulse a little bit of all of you right now as we start this session. I'll give you a, just a minute, top of mind, don't give it too much thought. And if you could let me know when the results are ready tomorrow, that'd be great. While we're waiting for that to pop up, I'm going to be presenting uh, for about 30 minutes. I'm just going to run you through some very uh, helpful, hopefully, tips that, that I feel will ground you in presentation skills for what we need for this part. And then um, we're gonna have a little bit of a breakout session where you'll be working on an exercise. You'll go off in, in small groups with each other. You're gonna practice something. And then when you come back into the room, I'm gonna ask for two or three volunteers from each group. And I'll explain more about that at the time. So in general, this first part is a bit of a lecture, a bit of a, um, taking you through some certain things that I want you to know. The second half after the break, we'll be doing a little bit deeper into the content. So 29% of you are very comfortable, 43 are relatively comfortable and confident, and 29 are very uncomfortable. I'm so glad to see a zero for the bottom one that you're so uncomfortable, you're terrified. So that is fantastic. Okay, so that's actually good. We're gonna come back to that poll at the end of the session, and I wanna see if any of you have shifted how you feel because a large part of presenting with impact and confidence is how you feel about what you're doing. So we're gonna talk about a number of key markers that you can focus on that will help you see and then self-assess at the end of the presentation to see if you're feeling better about yourselves. Does that make sense? Now, I, um, when I'm in presenter mode with the slides, I'm only seeing a few of you so I will have to get um, a verbal cue from Tamara if there's a question that you really, really want to ask me. So don't hesitate to stop. If not, I'm just going to keep rolling through the content portion. Are there any questions so far, Tamara? I don't believe so, Terry. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I'm so used to not having somebody helping me on the side here. This is fun. It's, it <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, here we go. All right, so we have done the session, the, the session. So this is a little bit in the chat before you join the class today, we put in a document that's called, that's the checklist for virtual presentations. That's a resource document. It doesn't mean I'm gonna go through that content step by step, but I want you to download it and have it, have it close by as the session progresses so that if you have a chance uh, during the break to read through it or after you've heard what I'm, I'm going to present to you, if there's any questions from the content of that checklist, you can then ask me. My purpose, my reason for doing this presentation for you today is twofold. I want you to decrease your current level of stress that you might be feeling around any kind of public speaking or virtual presentations. And I very much want you to be able to increase your level of confidence. And so the whole virtual checklist is designed to do that for you. This presentation is designed to do that for you with the, with the information I'll be sharing. And the exercises that you'll be doing with each other are also designed to do those two things. Decrease your current level of stress, increase your level of confidence. I want you to succeed with every presentation that you get to do. Here's the thing, I'm a public speaker. I've been speaking in public um, even before I joined Toastmasters in 2002. I've done presentations and workshops on all sorts of things. I really have always been a little bit scared of being on camera. I didn't like my presentations being recorded. I didn't like anything being, I still don't like still shots and screen shares and all the rest of it. This little guy here, though, is probably what most of you are facing. I'm on a Mac, so I just have a little green dot at the top of my, of my screen, but some of you have bigger or smaller cameras. And this is either your friend or your enemy when it comes to virtual presentations. So the first thing is to remember that even though there's no audience in front of you or around you right now, I need to talk to you as if I can see you through that green dot. I need to, to feel like I'm reaching in and, and making a connection with each one of you as if I were in the room like I was last year when I was standing there. So do you get that feeling though? Um, maybe with a show of hands, is it possible for people to tell me if they feel that this little guy is a friend or an enemy? What we're going to be talking about then is, is how in feeling better about how you're putting your presentations together, understanding some of the psychology behind the presentation skills that I'm talking about, then that's going to help you be more and more friends with that little green dot, that green eyed monster, I call it sometimes. So in general, like this presentation is about having real impact in a virtual environment. So it's not me knowing all the bells and whistles of all the top technology, because to me, it doesn't matter what the technology is. The speaker is the messenger. The speaker carries the message to the audience in a way that keeps them captivated, engaged, interested. And that's, that's what I specialize in is how do you stay connected with an audience that's on the other side of the green dot. So one of the first ways to do that is to keep capturing their eyes, which is why presentations are, are fun sometimes. And so this is, this is just very, very basic. And you probably all do this brilliantly already, but I didn't feel right not covering this. Make sure your light source is good. I've been on too many Zoom calls where people are sitting with the light source behind them in an open window. Uh, I can't see the person. Um, what's behind you? Is your room a mess? Is there, I was on a, on a conference call, a contest at a district level for our Toastmasters and the, one of the contest chairs, his office behind him was a mess. Don't tell him I told you that. But it was really awful because that's all you could focus on. I used to broadcast from my office in another, in another apartment that I lived in and I had bookcases behind me. And I loved my bookcases, but people said when you're on a Zoom call, if there's bookcases behind you, other people are trying to steer at your bookshelves and see what interesting books you've got there, while some are, are saying that 
It's just too distracting. And for some people, it makes them dizzy. So it's, I've stayed, I'm in a boardroom at a, at, a, at, a, at a business center today with just a plain wall behind me. Um, what are you wearing? Uh, there's the old joke now is that you can't see anything from the waist up. So uh, gentlemen, if you're not wearing pants, then we don't know that. But it's important to make sure that what you're wearing isn't too distracting and is pleasant. And can the audience see your hands? Have you, have you put the camera where if I were to talk to you without my hands the whole time, you'd think I was in river dance, you know, doing, doing all the foot movements, but without, without anything that's going to just go and get you sometimes and say, hey, you know, lean in a little, listen to this. So this ability to capture the audience's eyes is really important. So some of the lighting, as you can see here, these are just examples that I found on the internet that are kind of fun, good and not so good. Um, are you centered? Like I've been on too many calls where the person's here or you're looking up somebody's nose or down into the lady's décolletage or whatever. You know, just the, the camera angle isn't exactly where it should be. So that's something to think about. What are you saying with your eyes? When people's cameras are on for, through a call, I am a terrible poker player. Whatever I'm thinking, whatever I'm feeling shows up in my face. So as much as I can when I'm on a Zoom call, I turn my camera off because um, I, I can react sometimes in a way that might upset a speaker. And I have a terrible habit of rolling my eyes. And so I'm sure there's some eye rollers out there as well. And so make sure, part of body language is making sure that your eyes are saying the same thing that your mouth is. Like if I were to drop my voice a little bit right now and get a little bit serious, I would change my facial expression. I would change what I'm saying with my eyes. If I wanted to talk to you about a, a sad or poignant moment in my own life, I might soften my face and change my eyes. But if I want you to stay excited and engaged and I want you to keep on this ride with me, then I'm gonna smile with my eyes and I'm gonna make sure that the energy is going and that things are rolling the way I want them to. So it's very important. We talked a little bit about this, the infamous Zoom guy with no pants on now. Um, and then, so their eyes, it's very important in a virtual world that you're really engaging their eyes all the time. The second part that I want you to focus on is how are you going to intrigue their ears? And I use that word really carefully. When I say I teach people TED style storytelling techniques, I don't mean building a whole full blown story or even a whole TED talk. What I mean is using TED style language, which is very specific. It's very um, evocative, visual. It can, it can snap an image into somebody's mind just like that, and it can help form a chain of thought that can change behavior just by the language we use. So how do you keep your audience's ears intrigued? Let's see. This I want to say right away. I can't tell if this little block, there we go. You are more important than your slides. So in other words, I prefer the speaker to be front and center rather than any PowerPoint at some time. And I believe Zoom now has a new thing that I haven't tried out yet where you can actually have the slides and the speaker showing at your end at the same time. So that's a great option. Are you being boring? Now, there are many ways to be boring when you're public speaking. Usually it's by having their sentences be way too long Sometimes it's because you're used to writing. You're used to writing papers and essays and project reports and briefs and dissertations, but you write differently for when you're talking than you do for when you're reading. And so shorter sentences, sharp bursts, using analogy, metaphor, all the really good things that make speaking interesting and exciting. That's what will keep our ears engaged. Biologically, we're designed to listen for danger. Okay, we're designed to, if we were walking back in the days when we were hunter gatherers and we're walking along, if everything sounded normal and the same, we'd just keep walking along, everything's okay. You know, might be getting a little sleepy even. But if those, if those uh, reeds at the side of the road or the trees 
off to the far side of your peripheral vision. If something starts rustling or moving there, your whole body goes on to, oh, here's something new. I better pay attention because this could be dangerous. Now, hopefully, when, when you intrigue an audience's ears, you're not trying to incite danger, but you are trying to incite interest and re-engagement. And you do that by not being boring. And not being boring is a huge skill set for public speakers. Use stories to make your main points. In some ways, I just used a story there with the, with the early gatherers and the lions and the tigers and bears, oh my, to make the point that we're, we're trained to stay kind of flat level emotionally and mentally aware unless something grabs our attention. And so that's why I chose that particular story to make that particular point. Stories can be five words. Stories can be five minutes. But learning what to say in a story, what makes a story good, what to leave in, what to leave out, that's what makes the big difference. And always reference the audience directly. Now, this, this is why you can read these kind of things from Google or you can, you can buy books on public speaking. You can do all sorts of things. But what does that mean? Reference the audience directly. Well, that means I want to talk to you as people. I want to talk to each one of you individually in a way. So one of the things you will never hear me say is, we all feel this, we all do that. In times of trouble, in, this, in these unusual times, you know, we all have these problems because we all puts you all in a big clump of one brainedness and you're not. Each one of you is even hearing the information that I've said so far today through your own filter, through your own sense of understanding. Some of you will be way more familiar with this content than others. And so I don't like to assume as a speaker that you all are feeling anything. And so one of the most powerful words in public speaking is you. And it's one of the most influential words. And it's as simple as saying to you, I really want you to understand what this can do for your career now and in the future. I don't want to say, I hope everybody here today, I hope, you know, this audience, I don't want to address you as a block of people because you're not. And so using the word you, what you will take away from today's session is so much more powerful than me saying what I want to teach you today or what I want to tell you, because then that's about me. Whereas public speaking is definitely about you in the audience, one person at a time. It's also the reason why you will never hear me say, how many of you have done this? Or how many of you have done that? Because how many of you is talking to everybody and nobody. If I met you in the hallway, I wouldn't say to you, how many of you went to Boston this past weekend? I'd say, Tamara, did you go to Boston this past weekend? Or Jim, did you go, did you go to the market on Saturday? I don't say how many of you, because you're only one person. So referencing the audience directly is huge. It lets the people that are hearing you think you're talking just to them. When I said earlier that you are more important than your slides, this is one of the things, and I think this has become much more prevalent lately, you know, less is best. Um, academia, there's a tendency to put a lot of information on a slide. What you don't want to do when you're speaking in public is put a lot of information on the slide and then read that slide to the audience because that gets really boring. Most people can read faster than the speaker can speak and so it just, it just becomes redundant or it becomes irritating for some people. So there's lots of books about slideology and how to, how to use that, even for data, even for heavy data, there's some great stuff. If you have any questions, send me an email after and I can send you some good resources for that type of thing. Um, am I talking too much? <laughs> no. One idea per slide, That's and this is a TED-based thing. This is huge. Instead of having bullet points, top three things, 10 tips, 
one idea per slide, let them grab it visually, and then explain it enough so that the audience has an idea of what your idea is talking about. I'll keep an eye on my own time here so that I'm not, um, <laughs> hopefully this hasn't happened yet. I can't see you, so I'm trusting that you're still awake. But the whole idea of being an engaging speaker that speaks with impact is to use all these little tips of public speaking so that you're not doing that to your audience. I love story. I believe that story is the most valuable tool that any speaker has, and it's the heart of any really good TEDx talk or TED talk. And this quote from Maya Angelou is just a little synopsis. Write an idea so that people hear it and it slides through the brain. So I love the brain there and then the heart. And that's kind of the, the basis of what story does. It's the vehicle that transmits ideas, messages, information sometimes and everything so that it goes straight from my brain and out into what you are hearing so that then you can take it in with your own images and your own filters. There's so much. There's whole seminars that could be done on, on effective storytelling. And we've talked about the reference your audience directly already. So, but this is what I want you to see. The image here is what I want you to think of when you're speaking in front of, a, in front of that frenemy, that green enemy, um, is that there are people on the other side and that's the kind of faces that they have. They're listening, they're interested. That's your audience, whether you can see them or not. I love this quote by Albert Einstein because that's the basis of every presentation. And for the three minute thesis and for some of what you're doing and some of the exercises we'll be doing later, this is really important. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. I'm not asking you to dumb down any level of academic speaking whatsoever in order to have impact and clarity, but I am asking you to challenge yourself to see if you're making things as simple as possible, but not simpler. And then one last point of content, um, and then I'll stop and we'll do some live Q and A's before I send you off for the first exercise. So if you have burning questions, hold on to them. The last thing I want you to do is, is to make sure that when you're doing a virtual presentation, you are giving the audience an opportunity to engage their hands. And so do you have a worksheet or a handout? You do have a handout. There'll be some more coming up in a little bit. We have a poll and we're going to be doing that again a little bit later so that you're not just passively listening, I hope. And anyway, and in Zoom, I, and, and Tamara and I talked about this a fair bit. Um, using the chat function to engage can be a double-edged sword. Uh, for the presenter, as I said, right now, I can't see the chat anyway because um, I have a little bit of ADHD, actually quite a lot of it. And so if I'm watching chat while I'm trying to deliver content, it can get very distracting for me. Other people do it brilliantly. So if you're able to do that, that's wonderful. But I will come to you, I promise, and see what your questions are. So I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. We're not ready to go to breakout yet. And I am looking to see, um, I'm looking to see what the kind of questions are. So thank you for thinking the checklist is a great takeaway. I love it. Um, the slideology and presenting data. Okay, so in, the in, the, at the, in this deck that I'm using, which Tamara has a copy, I'll give you an updated copy because I made kind of a tiny um, a change to it. I added a slide last night. There's a, there's a slide in there that I'll walk you through towards the end of the session that does have some of those. If not, I'll put them in the LinkedIn community. If all of you are part of that, that'd be great. I can throw in some resources and a link to a great article I found the other day about presenting data so that your slides aren't so visually discombobulated, okay? Um, and there are some people that are asking about the LinkedIn community, so that'd be great. So Clue has its own LinkedIn community.
often that's just adrenaline, right? And when, it, when our nerves are, are up and our cortisol levels are up and our adrenaline's up, we do have that, that um, and we, we want to get in there, say what we have to say and get out. So some of it's kind of fight or flight stuff. So practicing the iPhones and iPads and Zoom room cameras are fantastic practice tools. So sometimes you just have to practice those presentations so that you learn to slow down. I still speak too quickly, I'm told. And I've, the people have been telling me that for years and I just say, yeah, you have to listen faster. And that's, that's part of it. But my daughter, uh, when she's nervous, really speaks quickly. And so when she was going through her PhD and doing all the conferences that are part of a scientist's part of life, she had to learn to really just slow down. So some of that is simply practice. Record yourself, listen, take the time to um, breathe more. Often it's because you're trying to put too many words in a sentence and then you're just trying to push it. And most of the time, I would say nine times out of 10, it's because you've designed too much content for the time that you're allowed in your presentation most people will write a 15 minute talk for a seven minute time slot when it should be a five minute talk for seven minutes or a 10 minute talk for 15 minutes. So you have time to breathe, to make the transitions that are necessary, to pause, to allow the audience to think. Sometimes if you're scripting out your talk, it's really helpful to put ellipses, dot, 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 that remind you to breathe. Or you take a paragraph and then you have a big space so that you remember to shift your position on stage or remember to just take a moment. We're scared of silence when we're speaking in public, right? We'll do anything to fill in the silence, anything. And so then it just becomes, it's practice. It's practice, it's practice. Techniques for dealing with nerves. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot out there. Um, the biggest one is be, being prepared. One of the biggest reasons for being nervous is the tendency to leave things to the last minute, to have not thoroughly thought out what your message is, to know what the outcome is that you want from the audience, to know exactly what it is you need to say so the audience can get what they want. And so not being fully prepared, thinking you can kind of wing it, but kind of not, there's a part of your brain that will always say, uh-uh, guess what? That's what makes you the most scared of all, is that fact that you can't fool yourself. And there will be a part of you that knows you haven't practiced enough, or you haven't gotten the feedback you need, or you're simply not ready. And so that whole preparation I'm a, I'm a classically trained musician. I have a Bachelor of Music from Queens. And it um, almost destroyed myself as a pianist, especially in my final year when we had to do our performance exam in order to graduate. And it was because nobody taught me in all those years of playing the piano how to manage my nerves. So I set out to understand performance anxiety and I set out to really study it and I learned a load of techniques. I have a, I have a presentation called Speaking of Nerves, <laughs> and the whole thing is based around learning how to manage. So in a nutshell, you really actually have to practice. You have to learn. And the big thing is something I said earlier. When you start to focus on the audience and what they want and what they need, and what you want to do is give them this gift of your message or your thoughts or your words, it takes the emphasis off you. You stop thinking about, oh, it's all about me. I'm the speaker and therefore I'm scared. And, I, I, you know, and you're like the little deer in the headlights. When you start focusing on the audience and what they need, you will feel it in your body. Everything just sort of starts to settle down. And so that's, that can be a huge help. So it's not about you, it's about the audience. It's about practice, it's about being prepared, and it's actually understanding how many words fit into how many minutes so you're not trying to shove too much content down an audience's throat in order to get it all in before your time is up. 
So what else are we saying? Hiring addiction coach. That's really helpful, especially if English or the language of the audience to whom you're speaking is not your first language because diction and vowels can be a killer when you're trying to understand or make yourself understood. So that, that, is, um, that is very helpful. And what else am I getting? Yes, I love doing one-on-ones and small group coaching for TEDx and for presenters. There's, there's that. Rhythm of a speech. Yes, Jenna, you, you've obviously studied other speakers really, really well. Obama is a beautiful speaker and has a wonderful rhythm and he knows how to keep an audience on the edge of their seats. So now you get to be the audience. I'm gonna go back to screen sharing for a second. Thank you for those questions and for the participation, by the way. That was really fun and we'll, we'll, we'll be doing more of that. You're about to go into breakout rooms. Tomorrow's gonna to magically um, beam you up and into groups of four or five, depending how many actually end up in each room. And what you're going to do is a very simple public speaking exercise. And I don't know if you remember the Princess Bride or this gentleman from the Princess Bride, but over and over and over again, every time he showed up, he would say the same things, right? Hello. So warm greeting, polite greeting. My name is Inigo Montoya. His name. You killed my father. A very relevant personal link. Prepare to die managing expectations. Now this is, this is, this may seem silly and it may seem kind of goofy, but I have used this exercise as a, as a, a way of getting people comfortable, just standing up and speaking very quickly and in a way that can be helpful after. Okay. So in your breakout rooms, you're going to have maybe two minutes each. I want you to take about three minutes to think about this when you first get in there. You can talk it over with each other. I'll pop into the different rooms and, and see if there's any questions. So you, we have 15 minutes on the agenda for this particular breakout exercise. So it's gonna take a couple of seconds to get you into your room. When you get there, you are going to be trying to come up with your own polite greeting. Your name, that's the easy part right? Always start with something you know. That's one of the key components of public speaking. I'm hoping you know your name. A relevant personal link. Now that could be something about today's presentation, or it could be something about if you're in with a group of peers, find some, something that, um, that's not as extreme as you killed my father, please. And then how are you going to manage expectations? So that seems like a complicated component but I want you to just have fun with it and, and maybe managing expectations. If maybe your relevant personal link is, you know, I'm here to learn not to be so scared. And then managing expectations can be however you would fill in that blank. I want someone to be a timer when you get in there. You've all got little stopwatches on your iPhones and whatnot. So someone will be the timer. Once you start delivering your little presentation, you have two minutes. All right, so people are going to have to move through this very quickly. I want each one of you in the breakout room to have the opportunity to do that. When we magically whisk you back into the main session, I would like two or three volunteers from each of the breakout groups or one or two. We have to see how the time goes and we can come back to actually present to the group as a whole. Okay, and I'll give you some feedback on what I'm seeing, what you're doing well, and how, and how to enhance or increase that. So a little bit of live coaching, and hopefully a lot of fun. So now I'm going to stop the share for a minute so I can see what's going on. Are there any questions? I deliberately don't give a lot of content around that exercise, only because I want you to come up with your way of asking the questions about what does she want from us from this, which is part of it. But also, I also want to don't, I don't want to be prescriptive about what you're going to say. Now, a lot of people had more questions about the managing expectations part of it than anything. And that is a difficult one. But Nigel, even in the chat that you were just doing when you came back in and you said, yeah, it was great to see you. I hope to see you live sometime. That in a way is one of those managing expectation kind of conversational links that is perfect in this situation. So we had five breakout rooms, right? 
I think. Okay. And um, we've got some time. I've put, and we're going to take a break in about 20 minutes. All right. So we have 20 minutes now to go through what this exercise felt like. I love it when one person, and well, I love it, but I, I don't like it in some ways. She said that she felt like such a small little person trying to come up with, if, with how, how she could answer this. And the fact that you said that you felt like a small little person is actually perfect because that's often how people feel when they're approaching public speaking in the first place. They feel like they're this small, but they need to be this big. And so hopefully in the next 20 minutes, um, and I'm not going to say your name because I don't want to pinpoint somebody that was in a small little group. So, but I'm hoping that that you try this and that, that you see if you can expand that feeling from feeling small and timid into something that says, yeah, I can say these four things. And that's again, why it's very limited and very short, four sentences, not a bio, not a, I do this, I do that, all those things. I want you to have a little short snippet of what it's like to stand and present or sit and present and do it with that kind of, you know, confident feeling and feeling like, like you've got control of the green monster, your own voice, and what you want to say. So, and you just, you just posted in the chats, power posing. So yeah. even if you're Although, sitting, okay. even if you're sitting at your desk, if you move to the front of your chair a little bit, sit in a, what the musicians call a tripod position where, where your feet are firmly on the ground, but you're on your sits bones, not back on your tailbone. Lift your spine up, put your shoulders down, lift your chin up a little, look at the camera and tell me the same four sentences. You don't need to read those off a piece of paper. Just, just look, look at me with confidence and joy. But when, when you look at the person you're speaking to on a Zoom call, it looks like you're looking down. So it looks like you're not engaged with them. Okay. So if you look straight into the green dot or straight into the camera, your eyes will be more focused on the person that you're speaking to. It makes all the difference in the okay. world, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you for going thank first. You. Let's, let's just show appreciation. You can applaud. You can do the little reactions. I like the clapping hands there. I like the way you said hello, everybody, at first. And I like the way you leaned forward into the camera a little bit. Okay. So that, that way you're saying, hey, here I am. I'm warm. I'm friendly. Hi, everyone. Like, my name's Jin. Um, I'm trying to get people away from saying I'm a graduate student or mm -hmm. I'm a teacher or I'm a, because that's like a, a label of what you do rather than who you are. Mm -hmm. so that's why it's, it's fun to try and figure out a way of introducing yourself to someone without that initial label of, right, of right. Like I wouldn't walk up to you and say, hi, I'm Terry, I'm a public speaker, or I'm the greatest person. I, you know, no, so it's, it's just that asking you to think around the corner of how you might make that initial first, um, first greeting. So hi, my name's Jen. So what's the relevant personal link? It's a little harder in Zoom. If you're, if you're you know, meeting somebody in the corridor, like sometimes you do, someone mentioned earlier, oh yeah, I love your coffee cup. Or So sometimes the relevant personal links isn't that you're all in the same pod, but that the, there's something that you see. And so when you're in a Zoom call, like somebody mm -hmm. might say to you, yeah, I love the background that you're using today in your Zoom call. You know, and mm -hmm. so they're, they're creating some sort of, and they may then be able to say, I have a really hard time finding those kind of backgrounds, or um, I, I, I really struggle with that. So it's, it's looking for something personal, um, almost right off the bat. And it's, it's, it just, be, again, it's a skill set. So it's something you can practice with each other in different calls moving forward. But again, I, I, do, like, I do like the fact that once you started talking, you were talking. I felt like you were talking directly to me. Talk about your own feelings, or I'm really excited about this. And then you can say, are you? Or, you know, uh, or I'm looking forward to seeing your comments in the chat later. That might be a managing expectations piece as well. Does that I, make sense? It makes total sense. I really like um, your advice on asking the question at the end of my managing expectation. And by asking, oh, are you? And it's kind of inviting um, other people to join in the conversation. So I really um, like that advice. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I would just challenge you to find a question that's a little more, um, more than, that's not so general as how are you, um, but that's something that speaks a little bit more to the situation or the context that you're in right now, because that makes it more relevant. And sometimes people don't want to answer how are you right now. They could be having a really bad mental health day. They could be having, you know, real COVID, coronavirus, corona coaster, as they call it, you know, depending on where they are on the corona coaster, that could be a big part of it. But again, you have been wonderful to volunteer, and I really appreciate you being brave enough to step forward and do that. It's that polite greeting, and you want to try and say something other than hi or hello, you know, and so, so that, that can be kind of fun, although he just says, uh, hello, my name is. And um, the personal link and the manage the expectations are the two things that are out of the ordinary of the way we introduce them ourselves to each other. The whole purpose, though, is to try and think of it in four really short sentences, you know, so, so that you're not giving a mini bio or explaining like your entire thesis project. The second half of the uh, of of this workshop session is a very specific exercise for you using a story structure, a speech structure that I think would come in particularly handy based on what you're doing in your programs and what you're doing in your research. And so um, that's, that's gonna be a, a bit of harder work in some ways when you go into the breakout rooms, but um, it does help you create fairly powerful impact in a short amount of time. And that's what I'm really working on today is how can you get content over quickly with, with clarity and with impact in two to three minutes, in three or four sentences, or in using this story structure that I'm gonna show you in the second half. So are there any questions at this point? Are, are there, is there something more that you need me to circle back around? Has it become more clear around how you can play with this exercise a little bit around just having fun with being from the princess bride for a bit and uh, having that image in mind when you meet someone? So those of you who are back, I always like for the people that make it back from a break on time, if you have something that you, you know, a big aha from the first session or something that's just jumped out at you. I mean, Tamara was just telling me about two of, of her takeaways from the first part. And there was something that Nigel mentioned in the break to someone, and I think is a really great tip. So I, I might ask him to repeat it. Uh, but was there anything that anybody that's here? And Nigel's thinking, what did I say? <laughs> When, I, when we were talking about the, you know, having, thinking of the audience behind the camera, you mentioned uh, put a face to, to Janice. So would you explain a little bit about that while people are sort of drifting back in? Certainly. This, this comes from the idea of the psychology of having a connection through the eyes. So our brainstem is wired to be able to have those, the assessment of another individual and a connection with another individual by direct eye contact. And when we're staring at a, a camera light or even just a blank space where the camera happens to be, it's very hard for us to get that type of connection. So it's really easy for us to have um, more of an idea of a connection with the audience if we have a small picture of a human where you can see the, the person's face and eyes clearly without sunglasses. And that could be the target that you're actually speaking to. So you don't feel that you're just talking to a blank page or a, a blank chunk of plastic and electronics uh, with no actual connection. We actually need that connection in order to be able to feel like we're actually naturally connecting with somebody. Um, and this just comes from a study that uh, came out of uh, Freakonomics, uh, the, a book that came out about 15 years ago about um, basically keeping an eye on in-office theft. So people were stealing bagels if they had to, even though there's a sign saying, please pay for the bagels, you put a picture of, a, of, of human eyes over that, people actually paid more as opposed to stealing more because they feel that there's, there's actually a connection of somebody standing there in front of them. So uh, use psychology to your advantage in this case. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for sharing that with the group as a whole. It's also one of the, the human faces is something that babies are, are transfixed by, right? That's why so many mobiles now and so many images for children are a human face, like, and with eyes, and that's all they need is eyes and a mouth. 
some I know friends that put post-it notes just above their camera as well with a big smile on it. So they do remember to smile because that's the other thing that gives us that sense of engagement and connection is when someone's smiling. If the whole time that the speaker's talking, they're, they're you know, their face is stern and whatnot, then it's harder for the audience to want to warm up and then listen. And so that, that connection is so huge and it's so much more difficult in this virtual world. Okay, so we're now at 2.34. I am going to go back into my presentation and we will just keep going. There'll be time for questions again. This is a little bit more uh, complicated in some ways, but also hopefully clear enough that you'll get the point of what I'm trying to, to deal with. Here's the thing. It doesn't matter whether the environment is virtual or you're in person. It's more about the messenger who's giving the message than the, than the medium that you're using. And that's, that's the main point I'm really hoping that you get today. It's how you structure what you want to say, how you deliver it. And then the technology is just the, the vehicle that's getting you to the audience. And so that's why I don't focus on, on a lot of the bells and whistles that are out there. I focus on helping to increase your communication skills and your public speaking skills, regardless of what environment you're in. I love this Winston Churchill quote, we must learn to be equally good at what is short and sharp than what is long and tough. And that's never been more true than in this virtual environment. You can lose an audience really quickly. This is from another speaking coach friend of mine. She's a member of the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers as well. And she's just a fabulously fun person talking about the value of structure. If there's no structure, your presentation won't be clear. If it's not clear, the audience won't follow. If the audience doesn't follow, there's no value. If there's no value, what's the point? I have listened to so many talks, even TED Talks, even TEDx Talks, that I couldn't follow because somehow they hadn't been coached to have good structure or to have to show the value of the talk as the talk improved. So this is my uh, fun discovery that I made a couple of years ago. There's a wonderful book, it is in the resources, and you'll see in the chat that I also put a document there for you. I'd love it if you could open that up right now. It's called the And But Yet Therefore document. So I'll give you a second to grab that, maybe open up another window if you can and just have it nearby. There's a lot of words in this next section, but I'm really going to hope that you can grasp this little structure because this little structure can help you so much. We're going to practice this a little bit later on in a breakout session. I'm not actually expecting you to master um, what you could say in this in today's session. I want to get you started thinking about this. I'm happy to chat with you after through messaging on LinkedIn or through the, um, I have a Terry Kingston speaking coach Facebook page. Happy to answer questions there for that and keep conversations going after today's session. I want to introduce you to this structure because it really does come in very helpful in many, many situations. I'm gonna stop sharing in a second, but I just wanna go on to the, um, what it actually is. So what happens many times as a master's student or even with your PhDs is that you'll sometimes bump into one of your professors in the hallway, or you might be on a job interview and you're bumping into you might already be working in an internship position and you bump into your boss in the hallway and they say, you know, and tell me, tell me how your project's going. Like, can you give me a brief update on X, Y, Z? And for some people that kind of quick encounter with the boss or a senior manager or your, or your professor or your PhD supervisor can just make you go, you know, shrink and feel really small right away. And you'll do one of two things. You won't be able to say anything or you'll start talking and talking like the, like the one person before that says, how do I not say so much or how do I not talk so quickly? This structure 
is magical in that it gives you a way to take those thoughts and just practice thinking about them this way. So basically, the story structure that I'm talking about gives you a way to describe your context, describe a complication that might be part of the context, an aha moment, and then the resolution to the context. I'm going to stop sharing for a second because I really want to see your faces and see what's happening here. So if you have the document open, does everybody have it open? Can you just kind of give me a little wave or a thumbs up or something to say that you were able to get into that and but yet therefore story structure? Cool. Okay, it's in the chat. Okay, good. So Randy Olson is a former uh, rocket scientist, truly a rocket scientist, but also a Hollywood screenwriter. So after he left his science work, he decided to go off and become quite a well-known Hollywood screenwriter. And he put together a brilliant book called Houston, We Have a Narrative. And what he does in this book is he helps scientists explain complex theories and their work easily. Oh, okay. So, um, Tamara, can you maybe repost the document? Because if people do leave the chat, and I put it in during the break, so it could be, thank you, Jana, you're so cool. Okay, I really appreciate that. So everybody should have it now, I hope. So there's a link in the document to Randy's, um, Randy's book, if you want, but it's also in my resource files at the end of this presentation. So what Randy decided was that most of the time, if you ask, especially a scientist or somebody that's deep into research of any kind, uh, for an update on their project or an update on how things are going or, or what's happening in the lab or where they are, a lot of information can come out and it can, and can be too much. And so he decided, what if we were to look at the body of work that we're doing and be able to describe it as we would if it were a story or a three-act play? And so in the first act, if you think about, you know, most plays, if you go back to Shakespeare, or whatever, the first act is usually setting the stage. It's introducing the characters. It's bringing you information and context about the information. So Randy asked his scientists to find two sentences that could help set the context for something like that. So you have two pieces of information. You have one piece of information and then and and your second piece. So fact and fact. And so that's fine. And again, we're being brief and we're being as clear as we possibly can be. Two sentences only. Status of your, of your, of your work, however you're doing that. The second act in any play is usually where the conflict is. And it's usually, even if you think of story formula in general. Usually things are going along as they usually go along, you know, preparing for this presentation and getting all my documents in order until one day, or there's that conflicting event that happens or something happens in your research. And often what, would, what they were finding when they were doing this with scientists is they'd be plugging along with fact and fact, but then one day, the data crashed or something happened or there was some inciting incident of some kind or another that changed the response, changed how they were feeling about the work or changed how they wanted to talk about the work. And so there, there's a little bit of conflict and it's really easy to find conflict. As, as human beings, we love conflict. We're hardwired to um, kind of go to the negative in some ways, but what you want is to introduce the conflict even in your own research or your own work and then bring it out in such a way that you're providing a solution and that's the therefore so you've got and you've got fact and fact until one day but then such and such a thing happened and therefore the nature of your your um, exploration could change or how you're presenting your final paper could change and so that's the basic and, but, therefore. We're gonna complicate it in just a second, but before I get there, 
I want to give you the example that's, that's on the document that you have. So if I'm trying to explain storytelling, I might say to you, here's the first fact. Stories are an incredibly powerful way for us to get our message across. That's a fact, right? Stories are an powerfully credible way, incredibly powerful way to get our messages across. And there's a lot of information out there about how to do that. There's tons. If you Google storytelling for public speaking, you'll get millions of hits. So stories are an incredible way for us to get our messages across. And there's a lot of information about, out there about how to do it. But we don't always have a lot of time. So in this case, I'm taking a skill set, something I know works. Stories are very incredible. And there's a lot of information out there already about how to do that. But so the conflict becomes time. The conflict becomes the ability of people to go out and search the best tools for themselves, right? But we don't always have a lot of time. Therefore, we need to find simpler ways to apply story structure to our messages. Doing a, a blueprint, a framework or something, or just even simply this, Houston, we need a narrative Coming up with this and but therefore narrative was Randy's solution to making a simpler way to apply story structure to our message. Does that make sense so far? Is there anything that's not clear about that? Looking good? Okay, good. Now, one of the coaches that I follow a lot, she's the former executive director of TEDx Cambridge. She's now their, what she calls their idea strategist. So when the TEDx speakers for TEDx Cambridge, which is near Boston, um, are chosen, they've already applied to a selection committee. They know their big idea worth spreading. They've been accepted to be on the stage. Then they go to Tamsin and she starts really working on their idea with them. And they don't get to the next stage unless she knows that she can help them articulate their idea clearly. So she took Randy's and but therefore formula and threw in a little complication that she calls yet. And so she says that in the second act of a good story, there's a moment of truth or a defining moment, an aha or a revelation that causes the third act to happen. If you think of any of the big stories that are out there, the character always goes through some journey, the hero's journey and the growth and the, the everything. And he has that until one day something happened or but this happened. Tamsin said, before you get to the therefore, it becomes even more powerful if you can throw in a yet. And what the yet is, is that one extra piece of information that helps both the character in your story or, your, or the information that you're giving decide whether to agree with the resolution. And so what's happening when you're presenting an argument to an audience, you're giving them fact, you're using story as the vehicle to help the fact. But the reason you're speaking in the first place is so that the audience can think, act, feel, or do something differently than they did before you started speaking. Otherwise, we're back to what my friend Susanna said, what's the value? So unless when you're speaking, you're trying to shift an audience's perspective in how they think, feel, do, or act, then otherwise, you know, don't, bo don't bother wasting people's time with speaking. Like, I know what I want you guys to be able to feel, think, act, and do differently when I'm finished with this workshop today so that you can just grab into structure, clarity, value, presentation skills in this kind of overview that we're going through today. So if you go back into your document for a minute. Um, okay, so Janet, can you hold those comments until the end of the workshop maybe if it's, if it's about things I'm getting a little confused there, but thank you. Thank you for all the support that you're doing. Oh, and by the way, here we go. If I were to introduce myself, there we go. She just corrected it. 
one of the things I tell t people when I'm meeting them, I say, hi, my name's Terry. And oh, by the way, I'm a four letter word. So Terry is one T, one E, one R, one I. And as soon as I tell people I'm a four letter word, they rarely spell it incorrectly again. So that's just kind of my little bit of a, of a way of making a memorable connection because then they'll go, oh yeah, that's the four letter word. <laughs> I'm hoping they mean love and not something else. But anyway, okay, so two pieces of information, fact and fact. Something that intercedes or interjects or connects with that information in a way that changes things a little bit so it's not as ideal. If you think of your fairy tales, it's every day, every day Little Red Riding Hood walked through the woods to grandmother's house and, and she loved taking her picnic basket. She was so excited to see grandma until one day, and until one day, that's when the wolf kind of pops up, right? Or until one day, um, Goldilocks and the three bears. And until one day when they were out, someone broke into the house. And so there are ways that you can start to play around with the structure that can be extremely liberating and a lot of fun. Again, it's an exercise. So as I say, I'm not expecting you to, to write a brilliant um, sort of five sentence description of your work today, but I do really hope that you work on this over the next little while and, and send me examples. I've, I've got some that I can share with you um, once the seminar is over as well, or the session is over. So back to the yet, because that's the piece that Tamsin's throwing in that's a little bit beyond what Randy had put out originally. Extra piece of information that helps both the character that you're talking about in your content and the audience agree or not with your resolution. Yet we know it's true, or yet so on and so forth. A story doesn't just have three acts. It has an important thing that happens within the second act. And that is usually the aha moment or the moment of truth or the, or the, um, the character defining incident that the character must shift something within themselves in order to overcome the obstacle. You can think of Yoda and, and, and Luke Skywalker, if you like, if you want a really obvious one, or uh, any, any of the big stories that, you know, the play out in all the Marvel things, the story structure is there. This is, this is so basic and so ingrained. Pixar has a story formula that pretty much follows this as well. And it's, it's there because it works. If, but it can all be unique to how you do it and how you present it, right? So if I were to go on to say, I'm, try, I'm trying to set a case here for you that I really want you to, to agree with around storytelling, right? And this yet is, is where I can encourage you to, to walk into it a little bit deeper with me. And so I'm saying then for, if we were to use the example I used earlier, stories are an incredibly powerful way for us to get our message across, fact one. And there's a lot of information about there about how to do it, fact two. But who's got time to do the digging on their own, right? We don't always have a lot of time. Yet, we know that it's true in this case that the easier something is, the more likely we are to apply it. That's a big yet. If I can make it easier for you to understand story and structure and how powerful story is and how much of an effect it can have on how your ability to connect with an audience, make an impact and be memorable. So you know that, you know that to be a fact, but you know it's also very complicated. Therefore, we need to find a simpler way to apply story structure to all our messages. That's the structure that we're going to be working with. That's what you're going to go into breakout rooms with very shortly. You can use this structure for the infamous elevator pitch. You know, somebody bumps into you at the bottom of the elevator, you're heading up to the top floor. That's where elevator pitch originated from, right? It was a, it was a particular hotel in Hollywood where 
where writers and agents would sort of hang around waiting for Mr. Big Producer to hop in the elevator. They'd hop in with them and they had exactly from the time that elevator left the bottom floor till they got to the top floor to pitch their idea. Okay, so you can use this and and but yet therefore formula to pitch a project to your professor. You can use it to give an update on, on a project that you're doing. You can use it to introduce yourself. So if you don't want to be Inigo Montoya threatening to kill people and preparing to die, you can use this and, and, but yet, therefore, as an introduction to bring people up to date with the work that you're doing. So here's the questions, and I will put these in the chat, but they're in your document. I'm reading off the document as we're going through this so you have the text and you can sort of grab it in this way. What is the situation that you want to describe to somebody? So imagine a case where your professor or one of your peers has said, hey, bring me up to date on your latest X, Y, Z. Ask yourself, what's the situation? That's fact one. And the, and the problem. What additional piece can I provide that will create tension and curiosity? And the case for change, the impetus for change that you want them to think about. And the new desired state or action that you're moving your audience towards. Every good speech, every piece of good TEDx talk, even somebody posted, Tyler Perry did a brilliant talk at the Emmys on uh, when he accepted his special award. And there's some really good language in there and some really good structure. So, um, what I want you to do when you're going to the breakout rooms, I don't know if you'll be with the same people. You might be different. Uh, we're doing this kind of just mixing it up as we go. I think there are fewer people this time tomorrow, so we may not need as many rooms, maybe three at the most. And then um, I want you to think about this. And even if only one of you comes up with a situation, you know, fact and fact, um, what would the but be? What would the yet be? And what's the conclusion? What's the therefore? So you can either do it as a group, talk about it with one person's example, or if you have time, you'll have about, um, you'll have about 15 minutes again in the breakout rooms, because I really want you to dig into this. You've got the document. I'll be popping in and out, and I'm going to bring some, I'm going to post another document. I just want to have another check to, to see if it has good examples for you, okay? Are there questions about this exercise before we send you off into outer space again, into the transporter room, whatever it is? So here's an example that, that Randy uses in one of his books, all right? And so one of the scientists um, bumped into a VIP or, or, or somebody in the hallway, and the question to her was, so what sort of research do you do? So this could be for any of you, right? What sort of research are you to do? Her reply, well, thanks for asking. I study sleep apnea. Yeah, I know, it's kind of wild, right? In my lab, we actually use rats as a model system. And for a while, we've been focused on physiological mechanisms as the controls. So two facts. She studies sleep apnea, well, a couple of facts really, in the lab with rats as the model system. She said the problem, what they've been focusing on, physiological mechanisms as a control, and here's the but. But recently we've realized the real answers are probably at the molecular level in the central nervous system. So, and sometimes so can be the therefore, right? So now we're changing directions and looking at molecular pathways. And that's my story, a shift from physiological to molecular levels. So you can see how simple that is, right? It moves right along towards the overall point. It's the kind of statement that won't bore or confuse people. So she doesn't go on and on about what sleep apnea is or the process that they're using. A couple of quick facts. Studying this, we're using rats. We've been focused on a certain component, but there's that twist. There's that yeah, until one day, and that becomes a powerful narrative. And so sometimes people say, how many words should it be? And it's, you know, you gotta use your intuition. 
what we're really trying to do is get you to think about what it's like when you can condense what you're doing into something that's both concise and compelling. So you've still got the breadth of the project, but you've told it to someone in a way that's kind of, yeah, you know, you're not dumbing down your research or what you're doing, but you're using those links, those little personal things that might really help. And then that becomes a way to use this narrative tool, this story structure to prevent your own stories or research projects. How are we doing? How did that land? Does it make sense? Now, did anybody come up with an example that they can share with the rest of us as, as a way of just seeing how far you got with this narrative tool? Um, I, can, I can share mine. Um, Yay, go for it, Alana. Apologies, I'm, I'm gonna keep my camera off just because my connection is, is very bad. Okay. So this is, this is about my thesis. Uh, student mental health is in crisis and it's only getting worse. But health and counseling services at universities are often already overwhelmed with volume. Yet students need support and resources to help them manage their mental health. So the aim of my research project is to look at ways to empower students to take control of their own mental health. Wow. Congratulations. So that worked really well for you. I heard every component of what we, what we were looking for there. How did that feel? Thanks. It, it, felt, it felt good. I really liked trying to fit something so big into a small structure. It was a challenge. Yeah. In some ways, you have to think of public speaking and preparing to speak, like doing, if you're, if you're on a soccer team, you do the soccer drills, right? If you're on a hockey team, you do the puck shooting drills and the speed skating back and forth and down there. So I like to find little short exercises that can help you build a skill set, whether you're with a coach or whether you're in a public speaking course or in a Toastmasters group or anything like that, so that you can take one little part, a component of public speaking and nibble on it and practice it and keep, keep trying to see how does, this, how does this skill that Terry talked about today, how can I use it with my own work? Alana, that was a brilliant example. So thank you. I really appreciate that. Yay. A bit of applause. Always appreciate. Anybody else get a chance to kind of nail what, the, what their five sentences or their and, and, but yet therefore could be like? No? I um I have one. Uh, it's it's a little bit rough, but okay. I can present it. So um, uh, flight illusions are a psychological experience that distorts how pilots interpret their environment. We know that these illusions have caused accidents and deadly collisions. However, we do not currently have a standardized method of measuring these illusions. Therefore, my research focuses on finding and validating a variety of measures to better understand and identify these illusions in a VR setting. Wow. Again, excellent. So cool. So cool. So clear. And you know, you're using words I might not be familiar with, but I could still certainly understand exactly what you were saying. And I know what you're about. That's so awesome. And so that is something you can use that in networking. You can use that at a conference. Jen, when you were talking about getting your conference presentations ready for the two that are coming up, if you, can, if you can learn to describe what your presentation is about, for one thing, by the time you've put it into five sentences, you know what the overall arc of your talk is. You know the outcome you want for the audience because you're trying to convince them or get them to agree or disagree. Either point is valid, right? with the information that you're presenting. And being able to do it in those five sentences, it's brilliant. Excellent, excellent. I found this really works well, even for people that are doing the three minute thesis competition, because again, it helps to crystallize. How can you take complex concepts like that you just spoke about and make it so that an audience can understand and, and want to listen and you're not, you're not, they're not, their eyes aren't glazing over. What I also want you to realize is that, especially if your camera is on, 
especially when you when you speak. Um, there was someone earlier on starting to speak, but hands were in front of her mouth still. Not not as much as this, <laughs> but I have seen people start to talk to me on a Zoom call and they're doing this, and I'm thinking. I really, I really focus on people's lips. So be aware that what you're, not only what you're looking at, but what are people looking at when they see you? Um, one of the things when you're on a professional call, uh, you know, no twirling the hair around. And when you're the presenter, make sure that you're, that you're, um, that you're sitting and that, that you're not fidgeting too much, that you're not, my daughter was a huge fidgeter when she first started doing scientific conferences. She found that she would, she'd pull her sleeves up and down and she'd push them back up again. And if she had bracelets on, that was how she got rid of nervous energy. So make sure that you're grounded, that you, that you're, that you, you're just kind of there. You're confident in yourself. Jenna mentioned the power of pose. I know some people, you know, there's a whole TED talk, Amy Cuddy's uh, talk on how you feel powerful before you speak by getting in that kind of superwoman pose. And um, there's voice warmups you can do. There's ways. I have a lot of energy when I'm speaking in a room. And I'll often, before I walk into that room, so I don't come in like one of the chipmunks or something, <laughs> I'll go off quietly and I will do almost like um, that New Zealand rugby took or whatever it is. I'll go, huh, huh, and I'm stomping my feet and I'm trying to ground my energy so that, and do you hear what happened with my voice just by doing that? Like just by doing some yeah. deep verbalizations, often female speak, women speakers tend to talk in a higher register and I have to consciously lower it so that it doesn't get irritating. And so that's really important, breathing in and breathing out. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be amazed at how difficult it gets to breathe sometimes when we're nervous and we're excited about speaking. So taking those few deep breaths, shaking your arms out before, you know, you can turn your camera off. If you know you're giving a presentation, turn it off until you're ready. And then when you're ready, be ready. Trust yourself. Practice. Are any of you in a Toastmaster group? I know there's still one at Carleton University that runs. The, the nice thing about Toastmasters is it is a learning environment for people to learn to be more comfortable with public speaking. And the important thing about it is that you're evaluated. So you get feedback. Because often people will say the best way to get better at public speaking is practice. You know, just practice, practice, practice. But imperfect practice can be worse than no practice. If you're practicing with a lot of bad habits, if you're not realizing you're fidgeting, if you're using lots of ums and ahs and filler words that, that you can't get your thoughts out without stopping with all those kind of um, interjections we use sometimes. The occasional ums are fine, it makes you human. You don't wanna be so perfect that people think it's a recording or it's so over-practiced that it feels plastic or fake, but, getting feedback, getting, getting coaching, getting any kind of, and I think you do this in peer groups when you're practicing for your presentations anyway, right? And I know the PhD professors usually have really good, uh, really good feedback classes like that, you know? So that's what becomes important is get coaching or get feedback from someone who knows what they're talking about. And then, and then just keep building your skill set, building your skill set. And building your confidence because that's what that's what can make or break a, a thesis presentation and that's what can make or break even a presentation that that marks are, are dependent upon certain presentations within your courses so today we've talked about how to be comfortable in the virtual with that green-eyed enemy frenemy whatever we want to call it and we've talked about content so delivery and content are the two main components. Those are the pillars of public speaking. What you're going to say and how you say it. And all of that just takes confidence, practice, time. So just in summary, these are some of the key points that we've talked about that you wanna make the audience care using a relatable example or an intriguing idea. You wanna explain your idea clearly, describe your evidence, and end by addressing how that 
could help the audience if they were to accept it. Those are all the things that we have worked through, touched on, used little examples of today. You always need a call to action at the end. And so some of my call to action for all of you is keep exploring the different things we've worked on today. Try the exercises out on each other. Get a little lunch Zoom together if you like and just ask your colleagues or your peers to try and come up with their own end but yet therefore and, and keep practicing that. You can even do, do it in LinkedIn with me if you like. I'm, I'm definitely there to do that. One of the big things I really want to emphasize is if you're talking about a problem, make sure you have a solution. So you can explain the problem in your two fact statements at the beginning, perhaps, but your therefore must always be the solution. Okay, and I'll, I'll, um, the second example just earlier, Alana, I think, was it? I, I, I can't see names anymore, so I don't know. But you had a brilliant solution for the mental health things, and, and so did the other. This is, we're talking about the power pose, and we have seen, you have told me in the second poll that your confidence levels have gone up. I want you to see that in your own mental image before you speak, so keep, a, keep a, that in there. We've done that. The final secret ingredient, hmm, what could that be? <coughs> when you are real, you have more impact. That's the reason my business is called Real Impact Speaking, not high impact or deep or lasting. I want it to be real. And real simply means you know how to be relatable or relevant. We've covered that. You know how to be engaging and enthusiastic. That camera is where your eyes go and your voice and your eyes, your face, your gestures, everything. Authentic. And that just means move the ego aside, all that little voice that's saying you're not good enough, you're scared, you're this, you're that. You're all fabulous people. I could see that just from the time we've spent together. And being amenable is just something we all need to be these days. And what I want is for your message and mine to linger long after this session has ended. If you're interested in any of the TEDx talks, uh, speakers that I've coached for Ottawa, Canada, and some of my private uh, clients in different places, although I think I just, oh yeah, um, then those, those links are there. Some of them are fun. It's, it's, really, it's really great. Some of them have like 50,000 views now and things like that. And it's just been a pleasure to coach each and every one of them. These are some of the books that I found are really helpful around speaking like Ted or using Ted style speaking skills and storytelling techniques, things like that. So those are all very helpful and different storytelling resources because I tend to think everything comes down to how well we tell stories. What I'm realizing is Randy's book isn't there, but I think it's in part of, it's in the handout that you have. This is how you get hold of me. I am at realimpactspeaking.com. Um, there's, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, and that's probably the best way for you guys to reach me is send me a message through the LinkedIn, and then my Facebook and my email.